misdemeanor of unlawful carry. When you use this statute, it's a felony. It's the same as me carrying it into a school building. Okay, and and uh, Louisiana Shooting Association just cannot support that. Okay, and also can staff clarify um, Mr. Zelinka's comments on knives being included into this firearm? I, I can clarify that. Okay, the statute is carrying a firearm or dangerous weapon by a student or non-student on school property at school sponsored functions or in a firearm free zone. So the moment you define these places as firearm free zones, you cannot carry a firearm or dangerous weapon. Well, knives are clearly a dangerous weapon. That would be revised statute 14 colon 95.2. And that's section A. Okay, thank you. Representative Moore requesting to speak. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairperson. Uh, Mr. Dan, I think I heard you say that you take your guns everywhere you go. So if you everywhere that it's school, legal. Okay, but tell me what you would do, and how do you, uh, if you were on a school ground, what would you do? How would you do? Would you put your gun somewhere you have it with you? What would you do if you were on a school? The ground? same thing I do when I come to visit the Capitol. I have a gun in a vehicle that is unsecured at the moment because I take it off because I can't carry it in here. Okay. So I'm just trying to make a, uh, get clarity on what you're saying. But when it's a child care or nursing home, it's an inconvenient situation? Or oh, it's, it's inconvenient. Safe, but you would, do, you would have to do it where, you, where it's not required, will not allow you to bring it in. You sure. would have to do something with it. Sure, I'm just I, trying to make sure I understood what you said. Yeah, I, I do not make a habit of violating the law. So being a law-abiding citizen, I would comply, OK? okay? Um, my wife's parents were in a nursing home, and we visited there sometimes more than weekly. And, you know, I I was just trying always, to make sure that I understood that you would not take it to a school, even though you wear you carry it with you. And you would take it off, and we would put it in the car, leave it in the car if you were at a school or at the, a building that says you could not bring it. There is nothing worth me getting a felony charge over. I just want to <laughs> make sure that I understood you, that you would, if necessary. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zelenko. Representative Knox. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Zelenko, good morning to you. Good morning. I want you to know I understand your viewpoint about the inconvenience of having to take your gun off to go in a building. I can really appreciate and understand that. Um, having said that, uh, you're not carrying now, right? I am not. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Uh, uh, I'm a former Marine. Uh, my MOS, military occupational specialty, is a machine gunner. Okay. Uh, I support the Second Amendment. So on this issue, uh, I do want you to know I get it and I understand it. Uh, having said that, I want you to know and everyone else to know that I have a great appreciation when it comes to uh, certain spaces in our society. And I think schools are one. And in my view, including a daycare as a school um, is logical. It makes sense. And so if you are, uh, you are in a position to tolerate uh, and, and being inconvenienced when you're going to a school to take your gun off seems to me it's not a far stretch to do the same thing if you're going to a daycare with kids zero to three years old. I'm, I'm just trying to understand what is the big inconvenience that you would feel to do that when you're already practicing that. We can agree to disagree. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, with my carry permit, I feel as though I should be able to carry at a school. In fact, should be able to carry even in this building. However, the law says I can't, so therefore I don't. I just don't want to expand these gun-free zones to other areas. Mm -hmm. But you can appreciate at the schools we have resource officers, whereas at daycare centers we don't? Uh, I believe that's correct. Okay, and you would agree that you wouldn't want any random person to come off the street who is not trained with a gun? 
like I have been as a machine gunner to go into a daycare center or to go into a nursing home or to go into a school and do something crazy and silly. If the, if the owner of the nursing home, uh, daycare center, doesn't have to do it for the school, if they want people to not be able to carry, all they have to do is stick a little note on the uh, door, you know, at the entrance. You just, and I've seen them there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that's up to the owner of the property. I've seen them there too, but I think the last time you were here, you made a point to say that not everyone follows the law. Well, that's clearly true. <laughs> I don't know if I said those words, but uh, it is clearly true. So, thank one. Are, are we still? I was just going to say one point that I, I would make is that if somebody carried in at this particular point in time, okay, let's say they violated the. Um, Mr. Zelenka, three minutes are up. Okay, um, I was just going to respond to his question. I, I, I understand, um, but that's the whole issue with the three minutes. It It's question and answer, um, but I appreciate that, and we haven't allowed it at, at any other time, so we're going to go on. Um, Chris, is it Patron or Patron? Patron, just like the tequila. Mr. I, I figured that, Mr. Patron. Good, good morning, Madam Chair and Representatives. My name is Chris Patron, and I am the founder of the Firearms Professionals of Louisiana. And I'm here to speak on behalf of a lot of the guys in the red shirts and purple shirts that you see behind me. Our sister organization, the Home Defense Foundation, wears the red shirts, we wear the purple shirts. One of the things that I want, one of the points I wanted to make is that passing a law to make something a gun-free zone does not protect the children. Enforcement protects children. The criminals don't obey the law anyway. So passing a law that they can't bring a gun in there. There's already a law saying you can't shoot people, and yet they go in and shoot people. The gun-free zones have not worked. We still have shootings at schools, even though we have, uh, sometimes we have a you know, person trained to stop it, they, they're not unable to. The police can't be there all the time. The only way you're gonna stop it is you do something like you do here at the state. Have machines that you have to go through to check for metal, metal detectors, and prevent everybody from carrying a firearm. I don't feel unsafe here. The only people with firearms are police officers. But there's a lot of places in New Orleans that I do feel not too safe. And I do carry a firearm, just like him. When I put my pants on, I put my gun on. And I wear it around the house. I wear it when I go out, I wear it all the time. I've been carrying a gun for 35 years. I've never shot anybody. And that's what you want to have. You want to have people like me carrying a gun at the school so that if something does go down, maybe I can step in and stop it early, like they did, like the guy did in Indiana in the shopping center where he, the, the, the would-be mass shooter shot two rounds and boom, he, he was taken out. Or like the, the guy in Dallas with a shotgun, he, was, he shot one shot out and he was dead. Good guys take down bad guys. Cops can do it eventually but they're not gonna be able to get there soon enough. So my suggestion is gun-free zones are like waving a red flag in front of a bull. It's like telling everybody, there's nobody here that's got a gun that's gonna mess with you, so come on in. You don't wanna do that. So I ask you to vote against this bill. Representative Knox requesting to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Patron. Some things you said I can't agree with, and, and I would feel safe with you carrying a gun. Uh, you referenced New Orleans, and I, I, I thought everyone here in red shirts and purple shirts were here to support me and my bill, uh, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. <laughs> but since you referenced New Orleans, uh, I have a bill where, to what you suggest, no one should have a gun. I know. And I think to the point that you made again. with no one having a gun, that makes everyone safe. So uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, you have gone through the training and done what was necessary to be responsible and appropriate. And for someone like you, I do feel safe with. For someone like you, I don't have a problem with socializing or walking up Bourbon Street or anything of that nature. So I want to make that abundantly clear. However, there are individuals who are in my city who has no business with a gun and in certain areas in my city of New Orleans that you referenced shouldn't have a gun. And I just 
agree to disagree on a lot of what you said, but there are certain elements that I wholeheartedly agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Knox. Rep. Chair Bacala requesting to speak. Just, uh, you guys have been in the middle of this for a long time. I, and I think if I'm looking at child daycare center, and that's a private business, doesn't, and I apologize, I was presenting bills in another committee, but doesn't the owner of that daycare facility have the, have the authority as an owner to say this is a gun-free zone? Yes. And by doing so, it kicks in other statutes that, that you're illegally on my property if you're armed. It's not necessarily a gun charge, but it's a, a entry remaining or somewhere out there, right? Or, or an well, early learning center or a nursing home. Any of them can make themselves individually as the owner of the property. They can self-impose basically a gun-free zone. They can say, no guns allowed in my facility. This is my home. You can't come here with it. Yes. So right now we're, we're, we're basically the, the owner has that option to say no guns here, but we're taking the, the choice away from him or her. Yes, right. you are. Correct. Okay, I, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, maybe the question had already been asked. I just wanted to get clarity on that since I was not here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Bacala. Madam uh, Chair, we could I make one more point? One more point to who or what? To, regarding this bill. I just want to, it's a quick one. Okay, I, I, and listen, I, I need everyone to understand we have a three-minute rule, and we've had a three-minute rule in special session, and here we've got a long agenda, um, and I really am requesting everyone to respect the three-minute rule. Okay, can we win? Very, very briefly. What does nursing homes have to do with children? Nothing. Leave Thank them out of this altogether. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Patron. Uh, Kelby Senor. Uh, thank you, Chair Lady Villio. My name is Kelby Siener. I'm the National Rifle Association State Director for Louisiana. And on behalf of the NRA and our thousands of members in Louisiana, we strongly oppose House Bill 750. As has been previously stated, this would create firearm-free zones and would ban firearms in a child daycare center, a development center, and an early learning center, a nursing facility, or nursing home. A, a problem does not exist in Louisiana in these aforementioned places. And put plainly, this bill is completely unnecessary. This bill is not only unnecessary because there not have, been any, have not been any problems, but is also because problems exist with this bill. This legislation would pose a threat to honest, law-abiding citizens who would easily be ensnared by this bill should it become law. And as Dan Zelenka has already stated, uh, if someone brings a firearm into a firearm-free zone, it results in a charge of a felony. And this, this bill, unfortunately, there's little that could be offered as defense for that. If you unknowingly take a firearm into or in some cases near one of these facilities, you are guilty. It does, not account, it does not account for a person's intent, and perhaps this is why gun-free zones or location restrictions simply have not worked. As Representative Horton already stated, 94 percent of mass public shootings occur in places where civilians are banned from having guns. So this bill would ad create additional gun-free zones where people are left defenseless. Unfo unfortunately, this bill will create more problems than it will solve, and it raises a whole host of other issues. This bill does not enhance public safety, but it creates a patchwork of confusing laws across the state. Gun-free zones, which are created and enforced, have never stopped a single criminal act. And to the contrary, one might argue that these areas outlined invite criminal activity rather than discourage it. Because this bill is unnecessary, ineffective, and it will create more problems than it solves, we respectfully ask that you oppose House Bill 750. Thank you, Mr. Senior. Uh, Representative Walters. Thank you, Chair. The 93%, 94% statistic that uh, you and Rep. Horton are quoting, quoting, where does that come from? Uh, the Crime Prevention and Research Center. Okay. Also, is it your belief, similar to uh, Mrs. Lincoln, that you should just be able to carry anywhere? You should be able to carry where you're able to legally carry, and certainly do not believe that you should expand firearm-free zones to prohibit law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. Okay. Thank you. Curate Walters, Rep. Knox. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm trying to understand, is it your position that gun-free zones 
make us less safe? Correct. Can you're you not explain a, how, you're not, why uh, that When is? you create a, a gun-free zone, you're inviting folks to say there's no one here that's able to defend themselves. So law-abiding citizens are restricted from their their right to self-defense in these areas. And it's been proven over time that, that criminals, they're looking to create heinous acts. I mean, they, they unfortunately sometimes go to these gun-free zones. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed, and I'm not seeing the correlation in your premise that a gun-free zone attracts a criminal to come and do a crime. Criminals don't follow the law. I mean, they're do not they going to follow gun-free zones. They're not going to follow a firearm-free zone. But your premise is that a gun-free zone would make us less safe. Correct. And I'm trying to understand with great appreciation. If, if where do how do you come to that? You're conclusion? restricting law-abiding citizens' ability to carry a firearm for defense. What does that have to do with a criminal? Are they seeking out gun-free zones? You're 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 leaving them vulnerable to where they cannot defend themselves. A law-abiding citizen is vulnerable. They cannot defend themselves in a firearm-free zone when they cannot carry their firearm. Criminals obviously do not follow the law, and they will carry their firearm wherever they like. Okay. I, I don't think you're understanding my question or not answering it, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rep. Knox. Uh, no more questions in the queue. Uh, we have Rep. Ventrella. Late. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Sinar, thank you. Uh, thank you for your, your testimony. Um, to follow up on Representative Knox's question, is it your belief based off of statistics that there are in fact people out there that spend every waking moment of their day figuring out how they can target innocent and defenseless people in these firearm-free zones? Uh, yes, I mean, there's certainly people out there that are looking to, to do heinous acts. And if we leave folks defenseless, it, it certainly does not enhance safety. And I, I, uh, I appreciate Mr. Uh, Patron's uh, comments earlier, and he stated that metal detectors, you'd have to put up a metal detector or something to try to enforce this thing. Do you think that a metal detector would stop anybody who is bound and determined to do harm to people in a gun-free zone? No, you'd have to put a metal detector at every single entrance and have to ensure that that's constantly monitored. But even still, couldn't somebody just blow through that if they really were intent on harming someone there, knowing that there's no one there to defend themselves? Uh, certainly. I mean, anyone can use any means of a weapon to, to cause harm however they'd like to. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Moore. Uh, got a question. My husband is a disabled veteran. And when we go to the VA and Shreveport mainly, it does say, you cannot have a firearm to come in this building. Are you aware of any situation where there have been incidents where someone has come in and shot up the place or whatever because of that statement? I'm just wondering. I'm not aware, but I just wanted to know if you were aware or any of the facilities like this or whatever. Are you aware where someone comes in? Uh, I, I will say that in, in firearm-free zones, I mean, criminals do not follow the law, and I mean that they're not going to follow a posting sign. So, but are you aware of any incidents? Uh, VA, this building, just wanted to know. Ma uh, Representative Moore, in in any place that is a firearm-free zone or places that unfortunately a mass shooting has occurred, I mean, it's a criminal is is doing that activity, and they're they're not following the law. Dan might. I see him writing. He might know. Well, I'm just yeah. curious. Well, just curious. So I do, I, do over, I do oversee the state of Tennessee. And unfortunately, there was a mass tragedy there in Nashville last year at a school, which is a firearm-free zone that did not prevent that atrocious act from occurring there. And that's just an example. I'm, I'm sure there's and certainly are many other ones that have happened across the country, unfortunately, throughout the past. Okay. Are you aware of a situation where someone was legally able to carry a gun, walked in, but caused this type of incident, shooting up, mass? Can you restate your question? Are you aware of a situation where someone that was legally um, had the uh, authority to carry a gun into a facility, but then turned on people because? I, I'm not aware of a law-abiding citizen who's ever done that. Okay, someone that did not have a uh, back, well, didn't have any criminal background, but
but had the ability I'm, to and I'm had not, the gun. I'm not aware of that. But walked into a situation and start shooting. You're not aware. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rep. Moore. I don't see any more questions in the queue. If uh, we could have Mike Weinberger, Barrett Kendrick, and Everett Bodian take the table, um, all red cards in opposition wishing to speak. Uh, my, my points have been made, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Weinberger. Uh, Mr. Kendrick and Mr. Badion, and I see Bruce Riley in opposition requesting to speak. If you could come to the table, Mr. Riley. Um, and Mr. Ken, let's Kendrick or Badion, whichever one wants to go first, please introduce yourself. Uh, good morning. My name is Barrett Kendrick. I am on the board of the Louisiana Shooting Association. I wasn't going to speak this morning, but so much has come up on this bill just uh, through testimony this morning. I think that uh, I should be in the seat this morning. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it well under three minutes, uh, but hopefully I can provide some clarity to a couple of such, uh, a couple of things that were talked about this morning. You know, one, uh, daycares being private property. Uh, I would or could be directly affected by this bill. Uh, I've uh, been able to teach uh, firearms-based classes at daycares for a number of years. Uh, and so by turning these into firearm-free zone, that absolutely could have negative effects on uh, people like myself who use them for legitimate reasons. Uh, the second piece is, uh, you know, that it is private property. I don't believe that the state has the authority to be able to dictate rules over someone's private property. Uh, theft came up this morning. Uh, I, the same, you know, daycare that I've used previously, I know just a couple of years ago, uh, they had a situation where while moms and dads were inside the daycare, you had criminals outside breaking windows and opening car doors and stealing things like purses. I don't know if guns were stolen, but they were stealing numerous items just in a matter of a couple of minutes and they were out of there. So clearly that can be an issue. I don't want to have to leave a firearm in the vehicle during that time. Uh, the, uh, the conversation's kind of gone to active shooter. Uh, understand that active shooters, uh, they uh, don't just impulsively snap. All data shows that they spend two weeks to two years planning these attacks. You know, these are not responsible gun owners that are snapping in the moment. These are you know, psychotic individuals or uh, psychopaths, sadistic, you know, uh, tendencies uh, or, you know, some traumatic people that are, that are stewing over something over time and time and time. And those are the individuals that are going in. You can put up all the security in the world that you want. If somebody wants to attack that facility, they can ta attack that facility. It was brought up about uh, uh, metal detectors and stuff. You know, understand when the TSA was uh, evaluated, you know, the first time they were evaluated a couple of years ago, they failed to find the guns and bombs 95% of the time coming into the airport. You know, because that's not responsible gun owners. Those were, uh, you know, hired government officials that intended to be able to sneak things through. And they were able to get things through. So, you know, creating a secure environment, at times we have to understand it's, you know, it can be a fallacy. And so, you know, it's for those reasons that I urge y'all to vote no this morning on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Kendrick. Uh, Mr. Badion. Uh, morning. My name is Everett Bodion. I am the vice president of the Louisiana Shooting Association, and I'm also an attorney and concealed handgun instructor here in Baton Rouge. Mr. Zelenka testified earlier that the firearm free zone is the only prohibited location throughout all the laws regulating where you can and cannot lawfully carry a weapon that is a felony. This is problematic because there are many, many places that someone who wants to carry a gun has to learn that they cannot carry a gun. And it's difficult to teach as an instructor. And as of right now, I have to tell people that the only place that is a felony that you really have to be careful of is the schools and the school zones. This would make that much more difficult to teach and make lawful carry for someone who is deliberately trying to follow the law a much more precarious situation. And I would rather not have that situation out there because it's going to be very difficult to explain to people who are legitimately trying to follow the law that they could become a felon for a whole other long list of reasons through a list of facilities that each thing in this bill, the definition of these facilities is a paragraph long. This would be very difficult for people who are legitimately following the law to follow as closely as they would need to. Aside from that, as Mr. Zelenka also said, 
having to administratively handle your firearm more often creates more opportunities for negligent or accidental discharges of the firearm. Most of the time when someone has a negligent discharge of their firearm, it is because they have to remove it from their pants, remove it from their holster for some reason they otherwise would not have to. I see Mr. Kendrick here nodding because he knows this as well as an instructor. The less often someone has to administratively handle their gun, the better, especially when they are doing it around their own child in the case of a daycare facility. I have a three-month-old child at home. I've already registered him for daycare in August. I don't want to have to pull my gun in and out of my pants just to drop him off and pick him up every day when I'm in the presence of the kid who's going to be squirming around. The safest place for a firearm is in the holster, in your pants, where you have the most control over and can secure it. Last point I'd like to make, there was some discussion here about the definition of a dangerous weapon with respect to knives or other instrumentalities that would be subject to this law. The definition of a dangerous weapon is in Title 14, Section 2, and it's a very nebulous definition. It's any instrumentality that in the manner used is calculated or likely to produce death or great bodily harm. So the definition of a dangerous weapon is whatever it needs to be under the circumstances. So this is also problematic. It could create another surprise felony for people. There is case law in Louisiana. There are two separate cases that found that a tennis shoe in the manner used was a dangerous weapon because the person was kicking someone in the head with the shoe and the prosecution wanted it to be a more serious than a simple battery. And that is actual case. A lot of the citations in front of me. But last point in my last five seconds, I quickly Googled shootings at VA facilities while sitting back there and I found at least three. Thank you, Mr. Podium. Forgot about that. Um, <laughs> and Mr. Riley, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Bruce Riley. Uh, you know, I wasn't planning on testifying this bill in particular today, but you know, listening to the conversation, I just felt like I, I just I had to say some things. Um, you know, for one, to 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 think that there may be about a hundred guns in the parking lot right now unsecured. Uh, I just think that's, you know, interesting. And the fact that everyone is very comfortable with leaving them in this particular parking lot where they're going to be here for potentially four or five hours. Um, and if that is okay, it just seems crazy to me. Like, you know, I've picked my daughter up from daycare and dropped her off like the next person. That's like a couple minute operation. Now, if I can, like my car is in sight when I'm doing the drop off. Y'all's cars are not in sight right now. There could be someone stealing all these guns. They could be watching this right now going like, dang, I know where to go to find some guns. And I'll tell you, I live in a neighborhood that is the most gun stolen neighborhood probably in the country, I'm going to guess. I live in the French Quarter. And y'all come and you want to go out to eat, you want to go to a club, you want to go dancing, you want to go here, you want to go there. And you might run into a spot where a guy says, no, nah, you can't bring that in here. He frisks you at the front. You're going to cat's meow. You want to sing karaoke with your, with your buds from, from college. And he says, no. Now, I don't know where you parked, but you didn't park right outside. So I don't know what you're going to do with your gun. But at daycare, you did park right outside, I assume. Now, you're going to have to go truck in all the way across the court or whatever, find your car, and your car is maybe going to get it stolen. This is where all these stolen guns come from. This is why all the guns are out there. And it's really, uh, it's not talked about enough. Now, nobody wants to have some kind of lock under the seat, a case, a, a trigger. No one wants to even lock these things up. They, what are you, toss it on the seat? I mean, if I had a brand new stereo or something, I would just leave it on the seat for everyone to look at. Now, granted, criminals are going to do what criminals are going to do. But at the same time, you're going to tell your own family, your own kids, like, don't tempt fate. Don't leave it out there. And so what we're doing constantly is tempting fate with all these guns to be taken because nobody wants to lock their gun because it's too inconvenient to pull it out of your holster and in this case just put it under your seat. And if you're worried about killing your own child who's in the, the baby seat in the back by your inability perhaps to pull your gun out of your holster and then put it back, then maybe you're not as safe as you think you are. And I think that you should at least be able to pull your gun out and put it back with your own child in, in the vicinity before you ever go out into public. Because it's not just your kid in that daycare center, it's a lot of other people's kids. And so you gotta be thinking about that, whether or not you wanna float your gun around or even bring it inside. Because who knows, you could trip and fall on some little kid's Legos or, or some toy, and all of a sudden this gun is shooting off and shooting you in the leg or shooting some little kid in the head. You know, and people do not sit around running through lists of gun-free zones of where they're going to target. As my man said, you know, people are stewing over stuff, right? And they're stewing over maybe the source of their frustration. When I was a kid, there was a thing called going postal. Thank you, Mr. Raleigh. Going postal was not about gun-free zones. Thank you, Mr. Raleigh. Rep Knox. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I just want to make the point 
to uh, Mr. Kendrick that I too am a business owner and, and I wouldn't support anything that would restrict me from having a firearm and the statute the way that it is now will continue to allow you to have your firearm if you so desire. Um, to the point that was made about uh, going into a daycare um, with a weapon, I appreciate the fact, and I forget the gentleman's name, but he's been here before, that you're well trained and I believe that you are and I would feel safe around you. And I get your point that you're making and, and I would want to continue to support that position that you have. Having said that, I don't have any children in a daycare, but if I had a one or two, three year old, I don't know you from anyone. And I wouldn't want you or someone like you coming around my kid, one, two, three or four, however years old, in the daycare center. And it's just that simple. I think the conversation that we're having at the table is overcomplicating this. And, and as I mentioned, I'm a former Marine. I'm a jarhead. I like keeping things simple. I'm used to guns. I'm comfortable with guns. But what I'm hearing today is this hysteria about, oh, they're coming for our guns. And nothing in this legislation implies or suggests that. I hear the concerns that you're talking about as, as it relates to felonies and things of that nature. But the whole notion that the government is coming for our guns is over-exaggerated. We're talking about simply putting a zone around daycares and nursing homes. To most people, that's rational, that's logical. And so I reject the fact that we're over-exaggerating what this bill is doing. I reject the fact that somehow we're doing something extreme when we're only making a logical transition to including daycares like we do schools. That's simple. You have a right as a business person to continue with your guns. Nothing precludes that in current statute or in this bill. So I would hope that we would turn the temperature down, look at the bill, and be logical and reasonable about it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank uh, you, Rep. Knox. Rep. Ventrella. Mr. Riley, uh, the people that you spoke about that would be hypothetically stealing guns, is, would you agree that it's illegal now to burglarize vehicles? Most definitely. And is that going to stop these people from burglarizing the vehicles in the French Quarter? This bill will not, but overall, the idea that we should be like leaving our guns around unsecured, that is, I mean, if you don't have a gun in your vehicle, it's not going to get burglarized. That, well, that's not the I question. I mean, it'll get burglarized, that, but That's not no the question taken. that I asked you, but right. I, I was asking that it, the fact that it is illegal to burglarize a vehicle mm -hmm. and steal a handgun or a computer or what have you, is that stopping these people from doing that? This bill? Is that law that it is illegal to burglarize oh. a vehicle? Is that stopping these people from burglarizing the vehicle? Well, I assume it's stopping some people because otherwise, why have any laws at all? You would agree that there are thousands of stolen guns every year, probably, Most in your definitely. area. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Ventrell. I don't see any further questions. Uh, gentlemen, if y'all could. Um, position Mary Susie Lubbery. Three minutes. Good morning, ma'am. Sure. It's going to be shorter than that, hopefully. I'm Susie Labrie, representing myself, and this is a personal testimony and thought. I have been in a classroom in schools, what are supposedly safe places, and I've answered on a radio show the question, what is the safest place in the world and what is the most dangerous? I said the opposite. Whatever you think is the safest place in the world is the most dangerous, and what is the most dangerous place in the world is the safest. And uh, our lives were threatened in a high school class. And then I had a friend beaten up. No guns, but there were other weapons in this classroom. It could be a pen, a finger, your fist. This woman almost got killed inside a classroom by a teenager with no criminal records. And your tongue. So any of these could be weapons and that's all I want to say. So if you have a gun-free zone, that doesn't mean it is a weapon-free zone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have cards in opposition not wishing to speak. Todd Rather, Gary Ballier, Paul. Boy, y'all got to help me with this handwriting. Paul. Uh, 
Say it again. Angrazano. Mel Lamp, Christopher Cavalier, John Brink, Lee Shaw, Devin Meve, uh, Robin Craig, David William Warren, Ken Clavery, Penny Patron, John Stump, Mike Buris, Mary Kennedy, Mike Remy, Brian Nikolic, and Gerald Newman. We did get one late card in support, not wishing to speak, Melissa Flornay. Um, and we have one card for informational purposes only, but requesting to speak, Michelle Anderson, Miss Anderson. <coughs> Vice Chair of the floor, if you want to get ready to close on your bill. Great. Miss uh, Anderson. Good morning. Thank you. Um, Michelle Anderson, uh, registered, uh, licensed, and responsible gun owner and an attorney. The mental gymnastics going on here today has been incredibly painful for me, and so I feel the need to speak up. 750 does not prevent a business owner from allowing an armed employee resource officer, what have you, on site. This bill does not amend 1495, which is the illegal carrying of weapons. It does not amend that statute. Look specifically at 4B, 1 through 3. Those things remain intact, i.e., you could have a peace officer, you could have an official or an employee acting in the course of scope in their employment or with the permission of the owner. So your amendment is actually unnecessary because this bill does not deal with 1495-4B, 1 through 3. But the, 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 again, the mental gymnastics going on here has just been complete nonsense. Um, we are talking about vulnerable populations, elderly, disabled, children. We need to make sure they're protected. And so if a business owner decides that they want to have a designated individual armed and trained on site, to your point, they can do that. But if they don't want any other wackadoodles coming in, concealed carrying, they have every right to prevent that. And this whole thing with the storage in the cars, what are you people doing? You, if you are truly a responsible gun owner like I am, you do not just leave your gun unsecured in your vehicle. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It sounds like that was a green card that you wanted to put in. I'm not sure. I'm just trying to. You did both. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair LaFleur, if you want to close on your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think um, all has been said for both sides, and I move. Um, I would ask that um, you move this out with amendments favorably. Thank you. We have a motion to report the instrument um, as amended. Do we have any objection? We have an objection by Representative Ventrella. And Madam Secretary, call the roll. Mm -hmm. Representative Adams. Yes. Yes. Representative Bacala? No. No. Representative Boyer? No. No. Representative Cox? No. No. Representative Fontenot? No. No. Representative Horton? Yes. No. Representative Knox? Yes. Yes. Representative LaFleur? Yes. Yes. Representative Moore? Yes. Yes. Representative Ventrella? Yes. No. Representative Walters? Yes. Yes. Representative Wiley? No. No. Representative Villio? No. No. Five yeas, eight nays. Thank you, committee. Thank you. Uh, we will next take up Senate Bill 377 by Senator Klein Peter. Um, and, and let me just say this for all our members and the audience. Um, we are now an hour and a half in. We have nine more bills today. Um, we will complete this agenda today. We have to be on the floor at 2 o'clock. Um, so if we have to return tonight, um, we will return tonight. So I just want everyone to be aware of that. I'm not trying to stifle debate, but we will complete this agenda today if it means we come back tonight. Um, so Mr. Gonzalez, if you can read Senator Klein peters instrument to the record, please. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, members, this is uh, Senate Bill 377 by Senator Klein Peter. Prohibits possession of firearms, ammunition, or electric weapons or devices by certain felons. 
Thank you, Senator. Good morning. On your bill. Good morning, Madam Chair. Members, this um, bill was brought back in 2022 by former Senator um, Peacock. It uh, passed unanimously in the Senate, came over to the House, and uh, Madam Chair, you carried it on the House floor. House, and it was vetoed by the governor. This bill simply takes a juvenile that has committed a violent crime while in possession of a firearm, and it does not allow them to carry a firearm or be in possession of a firearm until they're at the age of 22. Um, I do have an amendment that I want to offer up. You do, Senator, and I was just going to ask you if you wanted to. Um, I will go ahead and to put the bill in proper posture, offer that amendment. Mr. Gonzalez, if you would read the amendment into the record, please. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Members, this is amendment set 3208, and here's what it does. Amendment 1 makes a technical change. Amendment 2 is going to go between lines 11 and 12 on the second page, and it's going to state the following. Uh, the provisions of this paragraph, the paragraph that talks about a juvenile adjudicated 15 or 16 for certain felony grade delinquent acts. That's not going to apply to any person who has been accepted into military service as a member of any of the branches of the armed forces of the United States, the reserved armed forces, or the Louisiana National Guard. That's what this amendment set does in totality. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Senator, on your amendment. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, myself, uh, Representative Knox, Representative Wiley, all prior military. Um, I've served with some rough guys um, that came from all over the country. And I would hate to um, keep somebody that has committed a violent crime at 15 or 16 years old that is, is trying to straighten up their life and join the military, keeping them from joining because of this. So um, that's what the amendment does. Thank you, Senator. I would um, offer the amendment. Um, do we have any objections to the amendment? What, Representative Walters, you have a question on the amendment? Thank you, Representative Walters. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator, why is this exclusive uh, only to those who go into the military? What about those who go to college and change their life around as well? You have to prove yourself that you're a law-abiding citizen. We're having problems with these juveniles that's committing violent crimes at way earlier than 15 and 16, but we're just... It, Going to college does not show that you're cleaning your life up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rep. Thank you, Senator. Um, we have, um, I, I've offered the motion. Do we have any objections to the motion for the amendment? Hearing none, let the amendment be adopted. Representative Knox. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to say real quickly, I supported the amendment because I'm fully aware of what military training can do for an individual, particularly one who has troubled and who has gone through some hardships in their life. That military provide, that military training provides discipline and structure uh, to get an individual who normally had not had that in their life. So that's why I support this amendment and that's why I support the bill. Thank you, Representative Knox. Um, we have one red card in opposition wishing to speak, Stephanie Willis. Um, Ms. Willis, if you want to come to the table. Um, we do have red cards in opposition not wishing to speak, Demond Miller, Lauren um, Kingston, Sarah Whittington, Michelle Anderson, and Devin McVie. Ms. Willis, good morning. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Willis. I'm the policy strategist for the ACLU of Louisiana. Um, the reason why I'm opposing this bill is because it applies to 15 and 16 year olds who commit a violent crime with a firearm. But um, actually, what happens with this bill as written, the bill makes it so that children who are 15 and 16 at the time of adjudication um, for most felony grade offenses that can be convicted of being a felon in possession of a firearm until they are 22 years old, even though they are not felons and have no record of violent crimes. It applies to any adjudication that occurred when the child was 15 or 16, regardless of the age of the child at the time of the date of the offense. And um, I don't believe that it's limited to violent crimes, let alone a violent crime committed with a firearm, but I believe it also includes any any offense covered under 95-1, which includes felony drug possession and simple burglary, which are both nonviolent crimes. Mm -hmm. um, 
if um, we would want the, um, this bill to apply only to um, violent crimes committed with a firearm, the bill should be amended um, to that effect because right now that's not how the bill is written. Um, the bill should also be um, amended um, to attach the actual age of the, t of the child at the time of the offense rather than the age of the child at the time of adjudication if it intends to apply offenses that were committed when the child was 15 or 16. Because as currently written, it applies to offenses committed by younger children who aren't adjudicated until they are 15 and 16. So for example, a child who commits an offense at 14 then turns 15 before adjudication, this would then apply to that child. Furthermore, um, it's unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. Um, under the Louisiana Supreme Court, they have ruled under State v. Brown that juvenile adjudications cannot be predicates for convictions in adult court. Um, furthermore, there's no historical analog to this restriction to the right to bear arms under the Second Amendment. And um, treating young men who have not been found guilty by a jury of their peers as felons is a clear violation of their constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Um, lastly, um, with the time that I have left, there's a five-year mandatory minimum on this bill without the benefit of any probation, suspension, or parole. And so that means if an individual is hunting out with his family and does not realize that he can be convicted of being a felon in possession of a firearm, because in this instance he's not a, fel uh, a felon, he, can, he still has to go to prison for five years at least. No parole, no exceptions, and there's no discretion. Um, I realize I don't have that much time left. So um, if anybody has any questions, I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Walter. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Willis, can yes. you um, go back over the application of this that you were talking about when it comes to 15 and 16 years old in terms of the, um, not emancipation, the adjudication? Sure. Can you reiterate that for me, please? Thank so, you. Yeah. I th Excuse me. Yes, at the time, um, the way the bill is written currently, it states adjudication, um, adjudication at 15 or 16. So technically, a child could have committed the crime when they were 14 years old. Um, so it's not only the bill as written is not applying only to 15 and 16 years old as it's written. So it would, ne it would need to be amended. The language would need to be amended in order for that to apply. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Rep. Walters. Uh, Megan Garvey, uh, Lake Cardin, present in opposition, wishing to speak. Ms. Garvey, welcome. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for squeezing me in. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, my colleague here did a great job of touching on all of the main issues, but I just wanted to unpack a little bit um, because, you know, under the time crunch, um, a little bit about the 14th Amendment issues here. Um, so there is case law from the Supreme Court under um, Apprendi versus New Jersey um, that requires that any facts that are used for a conviction or anything where we're enhancing a punishment um, those facts must be determined by a jury, right? Um, now, there is one exception, and that exception is for a prior conviction. But here we are not talking about convictions. We are talking about adjudications, right? And so the difference is that adults have the right to a jury trial, and you have to have the right to a jury trial in order to be convicted of a crime. And that's, what Apprend that's the only exception that Apprendi allows in order to enhance a penalty. Here we're allowing children who have been adjudicated, children who do not have the right to have a jury trial um, to have their delinquent behaviors count against them in the future into adulthood. That is prohibited, I believe, by certain provisions of the Children's Code, but certainly by the 14th Amendment in the holding under Apprendi. And then, um, as um, my colleague stated, State versus Brown is the Louisiana case from 2004 that interpreted Apprendi specifically based on our laws and based on the United States Constitution to say specifically when we're talking about juvenile adjudications, those cannot be used to increase punishment or be the predicate for a new charge um, once a child becomes an adult. So even if this is passed, it's unenforceable. Legally, it is patently unconstitutional. So Thank I would urge you not to pass it. Thank you, Ms. Garvey. Representative Knox. Thank you, Madam Chair. So both of you mentioned um, amending it with appropriate language. What language is appropriate? I didn't mention amending. 
Well, I, I mentioned amending it. I simply stated in order for it to in order for it to apply the way in which I believe um, Senator Klein Peter wants it to apply, you have to amend the language. So in, in, in essence, you would have to say, um, hold on one second. Representative Knox, that is not an amendment that's going to be able to be accomplished in committee, but but certainly, uh, and I welcome you to continue your answer, mm -hmm. Ms. Willis, but certainly um, I welcome you and, you know, to work with Senator Klein Peter um, on that language between now and the floor if necessary. And that's not something we often do, but but certainly um, I would welcome that in this instance. Thank Shirley. You, so it, it would have to, the language would have to change to say not adjudicated, but when the, um, I guess when the offense was committed, if that makes sense, because adjudication is at trial. It, it makes sense to me, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at that with Representative Knox and, and the Senator um, and, and make some determinations if, if, that, if the bill gets out and, and we need to look at that um, for any reason. Um, thank you. Um, we have, I don't see any more questions in the queue. Um, we have one card in opposition not wishing to speak, Chandra Shea Foster. We have um, a late green card in support, Brian Guillory with Louisiana Guns. And we have a late green card in support wishing to speak. So that's a little bit out of order, but Mr. Weinberger, did you have something that you, you needed to speak? Very brief. Okay, but in the future, we, we're going to keep these in order of, of proponents and opposition, but Mr. Weinberger, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, my name is Mike Weinberger. I am the founder of the Home Defense Foundation and the co-founder of the Firearm Professionals, all the red and purple shirts. And I just want to say on behalf of the law-abiding citizens that I work with, I find it troubling to talk about 15 and 16 year olds carrying a gun and shooting people as children. We want to protect children and we have to do this and that for children. In my book, on behalf of our members, I will say this. If you're 15 or 16 or 17, you may not have the legal right to vote yet. But if you take a gun and you point it at someone and you shoot them or try and shoot them, in my book, you don't deserve to be treated as a child any longer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. I don't see any questions in the queue. Senator, you want to close on your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Members, there is another state that does this. It's Florida. They implemented this in 2018. They have been doing it for six years now. It was appealed to a higher court and it was shut down. So it's not deemed unconstitutional. Um, adjudication of a juvenile as a delinquent act under is not deemed a conviction. I agree. It's a determinant status. This bill is to improve the protection of the public safety. It's a common sense approach for the rise in violent crimes by juveniles with a weapon. And we're just trying to uh, improve the safety of the public. Uh, I ask for your favorable passage. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Do we have a motion? I will offer, I'm, I'm sorry, Representative Cox, it has offered a motion to report as amended, do we have any objection? We have an objection by Rep. Walters. Uh, Madam Secretary, call the roll. Representative Adams? Yes. Yes. Representative Bacala? Yes. Yes. Representative Boyer? Yes. Yes. Representative Cox? Yes. Yes. Representative Fontenot? Yes. Yes. Representative Horton? Yes. Yes. Representative Knox? Yes. Yes. Representative LaFleur? Representative Moore? Representative Ventrella. Representative Bo Bode. No. Uh, Representative Moore, no. Representative Ventrella. Representative Walters. No. no. Representative Wiley. Yes. Yes. Representative Villio. Yes. Yes. Nine yeas, two nays. 
Let the instrument be reported as amended. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair.